What manner of man was this? He challenged us to embrace nonviolence as a way of life, to understand our common humanity with all peoples, and to view racial and cultural diversity as a source of strength, not discord. That only peaceful means can bring about peaceful ends. That our goal was to create the law of community. He improved the quality of life for millions in America and gave hope to still more millions around the world. His dream is alive today because it lives in each of us and it's always there challenging in us to do better with our lives, the communities in which we live, and with our nation. You and I have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Good afternoon. I'm Ken Marshburn. I'm the mayor of Garner, and I am pleased to bring you greetings from the town and from our town council. It's a privilege to welcome you to this very special occasion where we remember and honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This event would not be possible without the dedication and countless hours given by our MLK committee. I believe it would be appropriate to characterize their work as an act of love. Dr. King, in one of his many quotes, said this about love, and I quote, I'm convinced that love is the most durable power in the world. It is not an expression of impractical idealism, but of practical realism. Far from being the pious injunction of utopian a, a dream, love is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. My hope is that you and I will find a fresh understanding of the meaning of these words and then follow Dr. King's advice when he said, quote, I have decided to stick to love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. May each of you be blessed and encouraged by the things you observe and the words you hear in this program here today. And may you leave with a greater determination to make your life count for the good of all you encounter on your life's journey. Thank you for taking the time to participate in this very special event. Hi everyone, it's Congressman Wiley Nickel and I represent North Carolina's 13th Congressional District, which includes Wake, Wayne, Harnett, and Johnston counties. I'm with you all in spirit today as we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy. I am personally inspired, as I know all of you are, by Dr. King's commitment to justice and equality. And I hope that Dr. King will be proud of how he has transformed this country but I know that there is so much more important and difficult work to be done. As your representative in Congress, I'm committed to working hand in hand with communities of color to safeguard voting rights, expand economic opportunity, and make thoughtful criminal justice reforms. I'll work in lockstep with all of our neighbors in North Carolina's 13th district to make Dr. King's dream a reality. We owe it to Dr. King and we owe it to our children, the next generation of change makers in America. I hope to see you soon in person and I'm wishing you all health and happiness from our nation's capital. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your many blessings among which we are thankful for your son. And we are thankful for the gift of Martin Luther King Jr. who through his life epitomized your greatest commandment, and that is that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. In his life, dear Lord, we saw the application of that commandment, and he left us his legacy with an announcement of his dream. And dear Lord, I too have a dream, a continuing dream. And in that dream, I looked upon a hill 
And I saw men, women, and children of all ages and all races and all creeds playing together and working together, and no one seemed afraid. And I asked an angel, what is this? The angel said, this is the kingdom of God. And I asked, where is this? And the angel said, in your own heart. And I asked, when is this? And the angel said, when men and women learn to love each other as God has loved each of us. Amen. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a desert state, sweltering with the heat of injustice and oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day the state of Alabama, whose governor lips are presently dripping with the words of interposition and nullification will be transformed into a situation where the little black girls and boys will be able to join hands of the little white girls and boys and walk together as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley should be exalted. Every hill and mountain will be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith which I return to the South. With this faith, we'll be able to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discourse of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we'll be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we'll be free one day. Hi, my name is Alexandria Prevet. I go to Garner Magnet High School, and I'm class of 23, a senior. Just a couple weeks ago, I was referred to as representative to the Garner MLK community to speak on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy and how even decades later, his work has left a critical impact on my life. I believe the answer lies just there in the prompt. And just, Merriam-Webster defines legacy as a long-lasting impact of particular events or actions from the past. The gift of Dr. Martin Luther King's mission goes beyond the unforgettable I Have a Dream speech. It was a vision imagined by the few that shook the country to ultimately be heard by the many. Countless sacrifices were made in his effort while Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood forefront bearing the pain of millions and vocalizing injustices on a platform that was made but never given to him or any other African American with ease. Such strength and character has invoked not only a sense of pride but encouragement in future generations, myself including. My aspirations were possible due to the dream drawn by Dr. King. His dream has opened doors for opportunity, emphasizing century police no longer be judged or discriminated by or neglected opportunities because of the color of my skin. Dr. King has proven that African Americans or any oppressed class is capable of coming, overcoming the obstacles set in front of us and knowing that progressive change is possible. His legacy has allowed me to have a voice at times where I feel unheard and have a seat at the table where I otherwise would not have been allowed to. The fight magnified by his legacy reminds me today that I will not be judged solely on the complexion of my brown skin, but because of my character, my capabilities, and who I am holistically, going as far to prove that I am just as capable of leader as any person sitting next to me. This actions is what other African Americans look up to, giving us motivation, hope, and fearlessness in times of uncertainty. Dr. King and countless other civil rights activists have given us a history of trying to look up to and as a breath of optimism and confidence even in our darkest hours. This dream has allowed me to never settle for less but always desire for more. 
gives me a legacy of nearly synonymous to freedom. So when you ask me what the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. means to me, I cannot give you an answer as simple or short as minister, activist, or martyr. Instead, I suggest you look at the success of the black and brown youth today, where we now hear remarkable accomplishments associated with names such as Amanda Gorman, David Price, Deja Taylor, Naja Quill, and Marley Davis. This is just a short list in comparison to the scroll of opportunities that can be indebted to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy.
hmm, where do I go when there's nowhere else to turn? And who can I talk to when nobody wants to listen? And who can I lean on when there's no foundation stable? I go to the rock. I know he's able, I go to the rock. I go of my salvation. The Lord is the stone that the builders rejected. I run to the mountain, and the mountain stands by me. When the earth all around me is sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock I I go to the rock. Where do I go? When the storms of life are threatening, who can I talk to? When the winds of sorrows blow, and is there a refuge? In the time of tribulation, I go to the rock. He's able, I go, oh, I go, of my salvation, that the builders rejected, I run to the mountain, and the mountain stands by me, oh, when the earth all around me is sinking sand, to the South Garner High School. I'm here to speak about Dr. Martin Luther King's dream and what it means to me in this day and age. But I'd like to start off by saying that he has had a massive impact on not just me, but this country as a whole. He fought for equality and broke down the barriers of discrimination. He did this through fearless acts of public protest and inspiring speeches that fostered a movement which would grow into a never-ending force for justice and equity. His actions had big influences around the world as he provided a blueprint for civil disobedience that the rest of the world could follow. Besides that, Martin Luther King means so much to me because my life would look drastically different if he hadn't existed. Segregation would still plague our schools and cities, while the freedoms of so many would be greatly limited and unequal. Even simple things like owning a home, getting a good education, or getting a good job would be so much more difficult for people of color today. His dream has allowed me to strive for success and take control of my future without the obstacles of racism and discrimination. So I thank him for giving me and so many other people across the world and the country 
the opportunity to live our lives freely, equally, and peacefully. I believe that we can all learn something from his dream, and one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that you should always fight for what you believe in. On that note, I'd like to say thank you and have a wonderful day. Hello, I'm Jim Ferry, co-chair of the Garner Annual MLK Celebration Committee, and it's an honor and a joy for me to introduce you my friend, and in many ways, my mentor, Jimmy Hawkins, who will be our keynote speaker this week. Jimmy, an ordained Presbyterian minister, brings so much to us, so much experience, so much expertise, so much passion, so much of everything that we so need in this program today. Jimmy is a native North Carolinian, native of Henderson, and he also is a graduate of North Carolina Central University. He's a Presbyterian minister, has served churches in Virginia, in the Martinsville area, and for 25 plus years, he was pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Durham, a much beloved pastor there, before he was called to become the director of the Presbyterian Church USA Office of Public Witness in Washington, D.C. Jimmy, as I said, brings much experience, much love, much passion, much interest in human rights, and especially in Martin Luther King's living dream. Jimmy has served on boards of the National Council of Churches, has been on the board of, of the public witness of Church World Service. He also has been very involved in advocacy in communities in North Carolina. He's been involved in the Moral Monday movement since its inception in 2013. He also has served for a number of years on the executive committee of the North Carolina NAACP. Recently, Jimmy has written a book entitled Unbroken and Unbowed, A History of Black Protest in America, a history of great depth, a history of much passion. Let me read to you what one, one reviewer has said. Jimmy Hawkins, Unbroken and Unbowed, uses the words by which black Americans have always named themselves for centuries of struggle, centuries of struggle by the sons and daughters of Africa, a struggle grounded in the radical assertion that a person cannot become a thing. In his research and in his work and in his speaking, Hawkins calls every one of us to summon the courage, the love, and the political will to confront this hard history of our country and to alter its arc. I welcome Jimmy Hawkins, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say. It is an honor to be your keynoter for the 2023 Garner Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration. There was a connection between Martin Luther King and the state of North Carolina as he viewed it as one of the most impactful Southern states. The theme for today, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope, is reminiscent of King's words. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice as both promoting a determination to never lose hope even in the face of tremendous opposition. To celebrate the life and service of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. comes easy. He lived such a commendable life with an outstanding record of achievement. He won a Nobel Peace Prize, was a leader in the civil rights movement, marching in Selma and Birmingham, and was the leader of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. He was married to a talented wife and mother, Coretta Scott King, who took up the mantle of leadership after his assassination. Together they raised four wonderful children. But we must not conclude that his life was easy, filled simply with positive recognition and overwhelming endorsement. He was burdened with a sense of weariness and emotional fatigue, as many of his efforts did not achieve the desired goal. By 1967, he was suffering from unimaginable stress and anxiety. He uttered his most pessimistic statement about a future. He stated, and I quote him, I must confess that that dream that I had that day has in many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. I still have faith in the future, but I've had to analyze many things over the last few years. And I would say over the last few months, I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments. And I've come to see 
that we have many more difficulties ahead and some of the old optimism was a little superficial and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go. But he kept going on. Despite his own personal struggles with living a life constantly being threatened, stabbed, his home being bombed, he kept moving with a steadfast determination to do God's will. And the question must be asked, how? How did this man who inspired so many others overcome his own bouts of depression and even melancholy? I think that we get clues from the last speech of his life that he gave on April the 3rd, 1968, the eve of his assassination. He spoke before sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee in a speech named, I've been to the mountaintop. It is from his own words that we might discern his motivation for service in the face of insurmountable odds. Despite his emotional struggles, he remained an eternal optimist that was powered by his belief in something greater than himself. He strongly believed that there was at work in his service to humanity, the hand of God. He had a supreme faith in a God who was a God of justice, who was active on behalf of suffering people and who called his people to work for justice. He said, we, want, we aren't engaged in any negative protest and in any negative arguments with anybody. We are saying that we are determined to be men. We are determined to be people. We are saying that we are God's children and that we don't have to live like this, the way we are forced to live. The world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion is all around. That's a strange statement. But I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up. It was because of this optimism that he was able to discern a life lesson from almost any situation and find empowerment. As the most faithful ministers do, he experienced the presence of God in the midst of the most dangerous and life-threatening moments. This kept him moving forward, the belief that every cloud had a silver lining. And his optimism was grounded in the assurance that he was not alone that God was with him, and the knowledge that there were more people out there for him than there were who were against him. And not only did he have others, he needed others for their love and support that they gave him. It gave him strength. He was inspired when he came into contact with others of strong faith who were just as committed to the cause of justice as he was. King intimately understood that he was not alone in the struggle, that there were others who were willing to risk it all in the battle for justice. He had a support network of friends and colleagues who would rally to his side, members of every racial and social demographic. He would call Mahalia Jackson in the middle of the night to sing songs of faith and inspiration over the telephone to lift his spirits, his favorite being, precious Lord. And he said on April the 3rd, and I quote him, we need all of you. And you know what's beautiful to me is to see all of these ministers of the gospel. It's a marvelous picture. Who is it that is supposed to articulate the longing and aspirations of the people more than the preacher? When speaking in Memphis, he shared a story of the night he was stabbed in the chest with a letter opener. He recounted, and I quote him, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. The x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my iota, the main artery. And once that's puncture, punctured, you drown in your own blood. That's the end of you. 
it came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me to read some of the mail that came in. And from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in from the president and the vice president, from the governor of New York. But there was another letter that came from a little girl, a young girl who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter and I'll never forget it. It said simply, simply, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. While it should not matter, I would like to mention that I am a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering, and I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. King was sustained by the unrelenting call of being a prophet. He felt that God had a special calling for his life, and it was one of his primary motivations for his life's work. Not only that, he called the church to have a prophetic voice advocating for racial justice. On that fateful night, he spoke as a prophet, reminiscent of the prophet Ezekiel, who was carried by cherubim. King prophesies about being given the opportunity by God to live in different periods of human history using the refrain, I wouldn't stop there. He cast a vision of his journey. When asked by God, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? His mental flight took him to Egypt, but he wouldn't stop there. He traveled to Greece, Rome, the Renaissance, but he wouldn't stop there. He wouldn't even stop at his namesake, Martin Luther, when he nailed his 95 Thesis on the door of the church in Wittenberg, or at the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln, or President Franklin Roosevelt saving the nation during the Great Depression. No, he said, and I quote him, strangely enough, I will turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy, end quote. And as a prophet, he was strengthened by scripture, the word of God. He understood that the Bible demands justice and God is intimately sympathetic to the suffering of the oppressed. We serve a God of justice who calls his people to act justly. Scripture informed King of his sense of call and his messages were guided by that. He said that night, quote, somehow the preacher must be in Amos and say, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Somehow the preacher must say with Jesus, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, end quote. But prophets live in a state of dangerous unselfishness, willing to risk it all for justice. He said that night in Memphis, quote, let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. That's the question before us tonight, not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor. The question is not, if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The real question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them, end quote. King understood that for people of faith, it is not enough to say you believe. You must act upon that belief, that faith without works is dead. The Bible informs us that God not only hears and sees the plight of those who are in pain, but that God acts on their behalf and calls us to act. It is not enough for people of faith, especially ministers, to preach eternity in heaven and yet ignore the pain and suffering right here on earth. And again that night, he said, it's all right to talk about long white robes over yonder in all of its symbolism. But ultimately, people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey, but God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat three square meals a day. 
It's all right to talk about the New Jerusalem, but one day God's preachers must talk about the New York, the New Atlanta, the New Philadelphia, the New Los Angeles, the New Memphis, Tennessee. This is what we have to do. King felt a call to serve that nothing could deter him from. And he said again, and I quote him, let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination and let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation. We've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. And when we have our march, you need to be there. Be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together, end quote. That is how King managed to go on in the midst of the sinister forces surrounding him. Therefore, on March the 3rd, 1968, on the night before he was to have been in North Carolina, the night before his assassination, he preached his own benediction, and I share his words with you. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning, and as I got on the plane, there were six of us, the pilot said over the public address system. We are sorry for the delay, but we have Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the plane, and to be sure that all of the bags were checked, and to be sure that nothing would be wrong with the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got to Memphis, and some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult, day, difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. King was able to maintain a sense of purpose fulfillment, and drive to a phenomenal sense of optimism, faith, guidance from scripture, spiritual discernment. He was strengthened by the support of others. He had a prophetic call and a belief in something greater than himself, a God of justice. As we celebrate his life and legacy, we are called to emulate his determination to do God's will and to transform this world and to the beloved community. Thank you. This will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers die, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America's to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the hackneying Galleganies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the Calvacious Peaks of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. When we let freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state, in every city, 
We'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black man and white man, Jews and Gentiles, Protestant Catholics, will be able to stand together and say, free, free at last, last free, free at, at last. last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Hi, I'm Reverend Beth Gaines from St. Andrew's United Methodist Church here in Garner, and our hope is that your heart has been touched by the words that have been shared with you. Now, please know that you remain in our prayers each day, and we look forward to seeing you in, and the difference that you make out in our community. So as you go out into the world, I invite you to live and to work side by side, knowing that each one of you is important and valuable. You have great worth. And as you go, may the God who recognizes your worth, bless you and keep you safe. May God's face shine on you in love and may God show you favor and give you peace. So go in that peace to love and serve. Amen. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. I'm gonna walk through